we are fortunate to have uh, with us Christina, who comes from Fordham University, the Village School of Management. She's the associate director of the master's programs at Quebec. And she's going to tell you what we have, the collaboration we have, and what Quebec has to offer you. Yeah. And by the way, these are all job focused master's programs, targeted. So you can be assured of a good job at the end of the day. It's not like any master's program. These are, these are specialized master's programs. Right? So listen carefully to what she has to say. Okay? Thanks. Hello everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good? Lovely? Yes? Yes? We're doing well? Yes. 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 Thank you very much. I love that. Well, as I mentioned, my name is Christina. Well, as Mr. Souza had mentioned, my name is Christina. And uh, it is my pleasure to be here today at Sadie Xavier's College. Uh, just like St. Xavier's, Fordham University is a Jesuit institution. So as um, a student who is considering your options for after uh, your undergraduate studies, I'd like to think that in continuing your Jesuit education, you know what you're getting yourselves into. Uh, we believe and are passionate about the care of the whole person, so that is something that would continue on even in New York City in the Big Apple. If you're not a number with us, you would be considered as, you know, your success and your professional success is also something that we're passionate about as well. So I'm very excited to speak with you about what those opportunities include. Uh, to bring you through what to expect, we have the agenda, right? <laughs> to keep us all organized. I'm going to talk to you about some of our MBA programs so you understand what is the difference between a specialized master's degree and that of a full-time MBA program. We're also going to talk about our career services. We are a business school. so. In light of business, you want to hear about your return on your investment, your investment of time and the funds to study in the United States and in New York City. So we'll talk about that, the resources that are provided to you academically and professionally to be successful in this program. Then we'll talk about the admissions requirements. Um, are some of you considering applying for this upcoming fall 2024? Can you raise your hand? Or yes, maybe? No? That's okay too. And if you're not sure, that's all right. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit later, and we can get into that then. And then last but not least, uh, I will finish out by answering any questions that you have for me as well. So again, thank you for being here. Let's get right into it. Okay. All right. So this is our curriculum for the full-time MBA program. And something that you really should take into consideration when considering what is going to be the best choice for you for continuing your education might be that of professional experience or wanting to continue your educational journey right from undergraduate graduation. So with a full-time MBA, this is a program that's professional and is based off of working experience. So all of the classes that you see here, including the primary and secondary concentrations that we'll get into on the second slide, these are going to be based off of the professional experiences you've had working full time in your own professional um, work. So our students are required to have at least three to five years of full time experience prior to admission to this program. So many students are not coming out of undergrad and they continuing on. They're taking a break and working full time. Those types of positions are really in leading people, whether it's managing people, managing budgets, or managing a project. So it's not just about having a job, it's about having some responsibilities and leadership. You and your cohort will have those experiences in common. You will all have had working experience, so that will be conversations that you have in your classes, that will be conversations that you're having to reflect on and to utilize through those courses and experiences as well. So it's very much professionally driven. Um, because many of our students have taken a break from academics, we do have an orientation program in the summer that's a month long, where we talk about the classroom setting at a graduate degree, uh, analytics as well too. So many of our students might be coming from uh, non-business backgrounds for the full-time MBA. So we bring them up to speed with analytics courses. Uh, we also have consulting projects that are sprinkled in in year one, in year two as well. These experiential learning opportunities for our students ensures that you are use, utilizing the uh, 
information that you're taking in for your classes and you're working on different consulting projects and really putting that to text. So we have consulting groups, we have not-for-profit consulting, and then we also have for-profit consulting projects that will take our students all around the world. So we've had students who have uh, presented consulting projects through the MBA program in London, um, in Portugal, and Lisbon. We even sent students to Argentina and Buenos Aires. So many of our students have had that experience of working, but also then utilizing their experiences abroad and really making this opportunity a global perspective. In your first year, you have core courses, so they're uh, really focused on broad-based business. So this is going to be a lot different than the specialized master's programs that I'll talk to you about in a little bit, because this is going to be about all areas of business, strategy, operations, marketing, finance, Everything listed here is going to be courses you would be taking, whether or not you've had exposure to those courses or not. So as you can imagine, some of your, uh, your fellow classmates might have experience where you don't, and then vice versa. So there's a really a lot of give and take, collaboration, in small net classroom environments that ensure that there is a lot of discussion being taken uh, place in these uh, courses. So typically on a regular uh, class setting, you see maybe about 25 to 30 students in your class. So we really do ensure that in that classroom, it's a lot more smaller than say a lecture hall. So we don't have a massive lecture hall in all of our programs, whether it's an MBA or a specialized masters, it's going to be smaller. So then that way you really do build a relationship with your fellow students, with your faculty, and then also amongst all the rest of the community as well. It's very tight knit. In your second year, we have the internship over the summer. So for the MBA program, an internship is part of the program. In um, graduating from this MBA two-year program, it really ensures that you're being placed in a professional setting. So typically our students must have maybe like a trial period and that's where the internship comes into play. So the first year is us preparing you for obviously the broad-based business, but then also coaching you along the way for your internship and your career goals. So career resources are something that is a really big part of this MBA program from day one, going into that internship over the summer. And then, of course, throughout that second year, where we're working with you on placement afterwards. That's a big part of this program as well. So uh, you do have an industry-based career advisor. Same with as you would for specialized masters, but for the MBA program, you have a little bit more time because typically you're looking for more experience or leadership roles after the MBA. So there's a bit of a different strategy in place for career placement and career coaching in this type of degree as opposed to the specialized masters. And finally, in the second year, you're really focusing on different concentrations. So what are those concentrations? Um, typically, the concentration might have more of a business affiliation to it. It's not like a major, so you wouldn't necessarily have an MBA with a major in this or a major in that. It's really built to complement the broad-based business. So many of our students might come into the program with an idea of what they'd like to study. Maybe they're differentiating that area of business altogether because they've worked for maybe so many years in marketing, maybe in so many years in finance. So now they're looking to differentiate. So we do see students pivoting. We do see students building from what they've already been doing. But because it's a fully immersive program, this really allows you to really hone in on multiple areas as well. Um, so the concentrations are really there to complement you. So we have a couple of different ones that are primary, and then we have cross-functional secondary uh, concentrations that, again, are there to complement some of the primary. So say, for instance, maybe you're interested in FinTech, and then you may go into blockchain or possibly really differentiating that up. Maybe you're interested in uh, marketing, but you're also interested in operations. So we do see students who might have maybe um, the option of merging, combining. It's really up to you. You don't necessarily have to be married to any of the concentrations on your way into a program like this. In fact, we'll just coach you through and help you decide what concentrations might be the best for you given your professional goals. So again, this is a very professionally based program. It's based off of your professional full-time experience. So maybe not necessarily within reach of like the first year graduating, but something's for you to keep in mind for further on down the line, mm -hmm. or just so you also understand what is the major differences between the specialized masters and full-time MBA. And last but not least, I will add that this is also a STEM designated program. We'll be throwing out that term quite a lot today. And so what that means for some of you that aren't familiar with STEM in the United States and our education system, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. 
for any program that you study in STEM in the U.S., whether it's in Fordham or anywhere else, if it has a STEM designation, it means that you will also have additional time after you've com completed this degree that will allow you to stay in the United States and pursue professional opportunities on your own without um, any employment sponsorship. So it allows you some additional time in the United States after, and it's up to you to find those um, opportunities. We coach you through that and support you through that search, but ultimately um, you will have the ability to go all around the U.S. if you really want to, or to stay in New York City if that's something you choose as well. So again, there's free resources in place to help you with that, but in completing a program like the full-time MBA, you have two years in the program, and then an additional three years to stay in the United States to pursue those professional opportunities. So altogether, you're looking at five years to be in the U.S. to study and to network, to really take in the opportunity to study business in New York City, um, and then also to find that placement and find those jobs that bring success to you for the first three years there. And then oftentimes you see students either applying for sponsorship with their employer or returning home or finding another opportunity elsewhere as well. It's not uncommon for our students to find um, maybe a position with a Fortune 500 company or a world-renowned company and finding a position elsewhere outside the U.S. after two. So let's get into the specialized master's programs. This is typically my area of specialty, and we have over 11 different types of specialized masters. So unlike the full-time MBA program, these are going to be pre-professional um, programs. And so it isn't necessarily required to have full-time working experience in these program well, in these areas prior to pursuing these programs. So you can technically continue on with your studies from undergrad into grad um, into these programs. These are all different areas and specialties. So just like in its name, a specialized master's is very particular to a certain area of study. So um, if you're studying something in accounting, better bet that your uh, program and the classes are going to be fully in accounting. If you're studying finance, which we'll get into because we do have a partnership with St. Xavier's in our MS in finance program, you better believe you are taking a lot of finance classes. So as you can see, there's a trend here, right? There are certain classes that are going to really um, reflect the specialization of that program. We do have one exception, and that is to our MS in management program. So MS in management is great for students who may not have a uh, strong business space, perhaps maybe you had studied in arts and sciences or engineering or sciences in particular, but you're looking to really go into areas of business, discernible leadership, and really building that business background. So MS in management is the uh, exception to the specialization of the specialized masters because it exposes you to a, a couple of different areas of business, but otherwise we're really looking at um, preparing you for particular areas of business. I'll walk you through some of these and then we'll jump into the curriculum for the programs in which we have partners with. Um, so we have a couple of different areas that we split our programs into. We have the analytics, we have the business technology, we have finance, we have management, and then last but not least, we have professional services. So though we do have partnerships with finance and management, students are uh, open to and can apply to other areas as well. That is okay. Um, our analytics areas are typically those that are utilizing data and analytics to make decisions in business. So you'll see that as part of the trend in these courses and programs, but I'll kind of give you a differentiation for some of them too. And as you can see, there are some that have a STEM badge next to them. So that STEM badge means that there is a STEM designation allowing you the three years of additional time in the United States after completing this degree. These degrees are also a little bit shorter in duration. So it's a little less investment of your time and less investment on your wallet is what I also like to say too for the MS degrees in comparison to the full-time MBA program. In our analytics suite, we have uh, applied statistics and decision making that is also STEM designated and it utilizes uh, different areas of statistics and data or again, exactly what it says, decision making in business settings. Um, it's great for, and applicable to uh, multiple different industries. So you're really focusing in on a function of business. Um, we have often seen students go on to actually utilize the statistical measurements that they picked up in those skills to pursue PhDs after. So some students may use this for um, different analytical areas and work in those areas as well. Um, that could be in technology and finance. 
um, but typically we do see students that might continue on for a PhD. In business analytics, our second program there, that's also a STEM designation. This is utilizing programming and machine learning in addition to analytics for um, orchestrating different business decision making as well. Uh, it allows our students to really incorporate programming and machine learning across multiple areas and across multiple industries. We also have students that may utilize cybersecurity in other areas of uh, analytics in this program as well. There are some tight knit like uh, elective options for students that might be interested in maybe incorporating other additional areas outside of business analytics as well. We have our marketing intelligence program, which is a combination of both marketing practice and theory with that of analytics. So you're utilizing uh, database decisions or database uh, information about consumers, about products, um, maybe about markets in order to make marketing based decisions. So this is really in, um, in regards to products and consumer research and in marketing data and really honing in on advanced marketing practice. We call it marketing intelligence, but it can really be likened to something that's more of a marketing analytics as well. And that too is also STEM designated. We have our MS in information technology. So this is under our business technology phase as well. And this is STEM designated too. This area really goes into database management and operations. And again, incorporates some areas of machine learning and cybersecurity into that as well. So there is some give and take between business analytics and information technology. We do also have um, a uh, program that combines both the um, BA and IT, so the business analytics and information technology programs together. So some students take advantage of that and there is a course share that you can actually pursue. So you can actually combine both programming and then uh, information technology and database management areas as well. Um, we do have courses available in both areas for like artificial intelligence and really utilizing again like programming like uh, C++ and um, HTML as well too. In our finance suite, we have two different programs. We have our MS in Finance, which is one of the programs that is included with the partnership that we have with St. Xavier's. And so I'll go into deeper uh, detail about that uh, curriculum shortly. With the MS in Finance program, this is really uh, a great opportunity for, for students who have had maybe accounting, finance, economics backgrounds, that are really looking to go into client-based finance positions. So you're learning and have the opportunity to go into areas like FinTech and really incorporating Python and other um, areas of finance as well too, uh, like risk management. And then you also have other options to incorporate maybe corporate finance and investment banking classes too within this program. It's also STEM designated, so it gives students that opportunity to, again, extend their time in the U.S. In our second uh, course for finance, we have the MS in Quantitative Finance, which is also likened to a quantitative uh, or financial engineering program. It's very heavy in exactly what it says in its title, quant. So there is quantitative research, quantitative uh, study, and quite a lot that is expected of students coming into this program. So we do look for students that have a very strong mathematics background that are looking to incorporate that into financial markets risk analysis and also forecasting and modeling in the financial sectors in private equity or other areas of financial markets. We have in our management suite an MS in management, which really goes into discernible and responsible business and leadership. So there is a focus on those areas as well. This is one of the second programs that's offered in our partnership between us and St. Xavier's. And it does uh, incorporate other areas of business too. So you're taking classes across multiple disciplines, whether it's accounting, finance, uh, media, you're going to be incorporating those areas too. So many of our students might be coming from backgrounds that are not as heavy in business to um, really try to take on a different business background or trying to incorporate those classes for a business edge, I should say. In the MS and Media Management program, this is a STEM designated program, and this is actually more of the business side of media. So typically we see students that might have studied anything in communication studies, broadcasting, journalism, for, um, PR, and personal or public relations, and really allowing our students to see again um, that business side of the media uh, areas. We are nestled between um, some major media um, outlets like NBC Universal, CBS, and many of our students are taking advantage of that location for networking purposes in this type of program. 
Uh, we typically host like a media conference where many of our students have the ability to go and network and utilize what they're learning in their classes. But the beauty of this program is that many of our students have um, multiple elective courses, so they can really make this program whatever they'd like out of it as well, too. Our strategic marketing and communications program is an online only program, so it may not be um, advisable for students who are outside the United States to study, so I'll kind of gently skip over that one. Um, it is an online program. You wouldn't have that residential requirement that would allow you to pursue that visa process and then just study in the U.S. So though it's part of our umbrella of MS degrees, unfortunately it's not advisable for international students. And last but not least, we have our professional services. We have our MS in accounting program. So for those of you that might be looking for that CGPA, uh, the CPA uh, certification, this is going to be um, you know, a program that can help give you the advanced accounting experiences. We have faculty that come from um, major big core firms that um, also um, add different elements of accounting, like sustainable accounting and responsible business practices into the program as well. It is STEM designated if you study under the accounting um, analytics program or accounting analytics concentration, which allows you to really utilize technology in the practices of accounting, financial services, and taxation. We also have an MS in taxation program, which has actually been brought on completely online, but some of our students are able to take courses in elective courses in tax from the MS in accounting. So if you're interested in tax study, um, that can be something that we incorporate from the MS in accounting for you. All right, that's a lot to cover, right? <laughs> Let's continue on. And like I said, we do have the curriculums in place for the uh, courses and programs that we have a partnership with. I know I talk a lot, so if you have any questions, I promise we'll get to them at the end. Um, so just hold on to them too. Uh, we have a QR code for the courses too, so if you have any questions or would like to be taken to that program page, feel free to scan that. But we'll go through the MS in Finance first. This is a STEM designated program, as I mentioned before. It is 30 credits, but prior to admission, we do review you for prerequisite courses. So we do ensure that students have had um, possibly a finance background or economics or accounting background before pursuing this degree. That's to ensure that everyone's on the same equal playing field when you're pursuing some of those advanced financial courses and to ensure that you know, you're going to be successful in those classes as well. So those prerequisites are finance, accounting, economics, and then statistics. So, um, and then we also have finally the business communication course. And that business communication course is really something that we're looking at in terms of your presentation, your professionalism, and ensuring that you're going to be able to work well in a collaborative and consulting setting, say, especially in client services on the finance side. So we'll evaluate that based off of your, um, your transcripts. We do look to see if you've had any courses that might fall into maybe public speaking, um, English courses. Uh, and then for the statistics, economics, accounting, and finance, typically an introductory class in any one of those areas would also suffice in waiving you out of a prerequisite. Typically, we're looking for some demonstrated strength in finance or financial courses. So anything in which you have at least received maybe a seven or eight or and above out of the 10 is preferred. Um, and if, for instance, we think that maybe you might need to restudy this course because of maybe an unsatisfactory grade, we may still admit you, so that's no need to panic, but instead we may have you instead retake that course with us to ensure, again, that you have all of those courses or all that understanding and fundamental elements <laughs> and skills from that course before you enter the program. So that would be something that we evaluate you for during the admissions process. And if you do need an additional course, we will let you know that. And then you can work with our team in case you want to, uh, want to complete that course, maybe your final semester while you're in St. Xavier's, or if you'd like to complete it elsewhere, we'll work with you on that too. Or you can complete it in the summer in an asynchronous online course. So you don't have to uh, get up in the middle of the morning or the middle of the night <laughs> and study in US uh, Eastern Standard Time. We would have an asynchronous online course for you to complete between July and August before you arrive on campus. Okay, so we have a couple of different areas here. We have required courses where everyone in the finance program is taking. This is a fall entry course. 
So only students, um, students can only enter and begin the program in the fall semester. This isn't to, um, you know, um, disrupt your learning or to tell you that you need to wait up on your plans. In fact, it's really put in place to ensure that you are completing the program in a timeline that aligns with the recruiting for financial areas as well too. So we do make sure that students are completing and starting the program in a timely manner for their professional success too. These required courses are in different areas of finance, so like corporate finance application, and um, we have the um, investment application and financial markets and uh, responsibility. And then we also have the computational finance courses that you would be taking as required courses in your first and second semesters of the program, fall and spring. Uh, these are typically courses you're taking alongside your cohort. So all students coming into the program are taking these classes. Then you have the opportunity to really pick and choose what uh, elective courses are going to be best fitting for you, given your professional and academic goals and maybe your background. Perhaps you had already studied something that is similar to this, so you want to differentiate. Maybe you had uh, an internship in an area that falls into one of these three categories of corporate finance, uh, investment management, and data analytics and fintech. And so maybe you want to pursue something that is going to really give you a formal education in those areas. Um, I really do want to impress upon you the importance of not only being <laughs> some, an academic student, but also considering professional opportunities now while you're a student to ensure that you kind of have some sort of self-awareness as to what you are interested in studying, what you see yourself doing professionally as well, and then also um, really just having an idea of that professional setting. That really helps, um, you know, make you uh, unique to application for an application purpose for admission but then also when it comes to recruiting for internships and jobs after your program, especially in the United States, it really helps make you marketable. It is a very competitive market out there, and especially in New York where we have so many people in only so many positions. So we do advise that our students coming into the program have some sort of experience in the areas that they are pursuing. Um, so again, this is a 30 credit program. Uh, you would pursue the full, uh, program full time, so our classes take place Monday, typically through Thursday. Friday, we reserve for professional development, so these are co-curricular activities in which our students are possibly pursuing a year series, uh, self-awareness assessments, and then are also pursuing a responsible business leadership certificate. And these are um, really designed to give you, um, you know, lessons in professional development and what it's like to work in groups what it's like to know and realize your strengths and how to provide that in team settings and on a professional element and environment. So um, again, like Monday through Thursday, those are your courses. Typically you're taking classes maybe in the mid-morning, evening time. Your faculty are coming from industry. So more often than not, we're seeing a combination of full-time faculty who have completely dedicated their time to the area that they're studying and um, teaching. And then we also have faculty that are coming from industry in which they are working full-time still and then teaching as adjuncts. So um, all of our faculty have had experience working in the financial area. It's one of our strongest areas, I would say, given our location in New York City. Uh, we are within walking distance of multiple Fortune 500 companies, organizations, hedge funds, um, and we're within a short subway ride to the financial district of Manhattan, too. So because of that, we're attracting great talent in teaching and faculty, but then also really helping to incorporate that network in your class environment, too. So it's not uncommon for our faculty members to invite their, um, their network, their uh, colleagues and comrades from maybe across their positions in the industry to give talks to our students, to maybe sit in on different lectures and to have them uh, maybe uh, provide feedback during different projects and collaborations you might be having in a class setting. And it really gives you that um, opportunity to have more of an experiential learning in a place that is known for finance as well. All right, the MS in Management program. So I already kind of spoke a little bit about um, what to expect with this program too, but I would say that there's quite a lot of flexibility in the types of courses that you can um, pursue in the elective areas and across multiple areas and disciplines of business. So we really do identify this program as having mostly um, core courses and discernible learn, uh, leadership and um, responsible business. And then after that, you have the ability to uh, work with an academic ad advisor to really pursue the areas of business that would suit you best. So with that being said, there are opportunities for our students to really dabble into multiple disciplines and really make this program their own. 
This is not a STEM designated program, but it does help students that may have a very um, specific idea as to what they want to incorporate in terms of business. So say for instance, maybe you're coming from maybe a psychology or maybe a social science background, but you're looking to incorporate marketing. This could be an opportunity for you to really add that in, in the communications, digital media and marketing areas. Uh, perhaps you are coming from maybe a science background, but you want to pursue uh, non-for-profit work as well too. This will allow you the opportunity to kind of pick and choose different areas of business in your elective courses to then turn around and maybe pursue like not-for-profit work as well too in businesses that, again, are not just there to make a profit, but are doing good work as well too. It really aligns with responsible business and leadership and really um, helping to prepare our students to be better-minded business leaders that aren't just about out there to make profit, but are trying to uh, really better the world, whether it's um, taking into consideration the communities that are affected by our business decisions, or even considering the environment and sustainability as well. Uh, it is a 30 credit program. So unlike the MS in Finance program, that's 30 credits and allows students to complete the program in fall, spring, fall. This MS in Management program is very strict that it's fall and spring. So it's two semesters only and it is non-STEM. So you would have one year after the program in order to pursue possibly uh, professional opportunities outside um, of, of the program and within the United States. So one year OPT or occupational practicum training is what we call it. It's full time. So typically you're able to be a residential student still pursuing all the same things that you would as a typical graduate student in terms of student clubs and organizations, uh, different experiential learning opportunities and different networking opportunities and chats. But again, because it is a little bit more broad based, you have more freedom and flexibility to make it whatever you like. It shouldn't be comparable to a full time MBA. It's a little bit different. And I would say that it's more pre-experience and pre-professional than that of a full-time MBA program. All right, so career development. As I mentioned, you know, as a business school, it's not just about what you're learning in the classroom setting and the theories and the lectures that you're listening to. It's about putting that to test and really receiving that return on your investment. When you're pursuing your uh, degree in the United States, I know it's a huge investment of your time. You're going to be away from your families and your loved ones. And as a business school, we're very much dedicated to your success. Uh, it is a challenge to be someone from outside the United States pursuing professional opportunities that I'm not going to sugarcoat. I don't think I'd be doing anyone a uh, service by doing so. But I will tell you that you will have a support system behind you that is rooting for you to be successful. We have a career uh, placement um, officer who works with international students. So she specializes in assisting international students from outside the United States with finding jobs, with um, navigating conversations and recruiting opportunities and um, you know, talking about how do we find positions, how do you market yourself, how do you position yourself in a way that's going to find you a, a job placement after the program as well. So you have someone who specializes in international uh, student relations with corporations and recruitment. Then we also have career development officers who are really specialized in the industry. So it's not just about like someone like me who is on the administrative side who is assisting you through. They're coaching you based off of what they've done and what they've experienced. So if you're interested in uh, technology and um, really pursuing something in analytics in those areas, we have someone from analytics and technology industries. We have someone who has worked in Cisco and other areas and Google and really talking tech and being able to connect you with those opportunities because they've done it themselves. Um, the same goes for finance and accounting in those financial services areas. So again, we're really talking to you based off of the industry and not just based off of what theoretically you should do. We're talking about right directly from the network that they are from. So many of um, our advisors uh, are typically committed to the role full time, but some may still be working in those areas themselves. So they still have colleagues or they already still have colleagues and uh, networks that they're bringing in to speak with you. Uh, there's workshops that they'll be hosting to really go over like how to present yourself. So having a CV and a resume that would work in the United States because sometimes there is a bit of a cultural difference between what you may have used in an undergrad setting in Mumbai versus what you would use for recruitment in New York. So we would want to make sure that you're presenting yourself in the best light forward, uh, walking you through cover letters. So um, how to present yourself in that way. 
elevator pitches. So I'm not sure if anyone knows what an elevator pitch or speech is, but having maybe just a short period or a snippet of time in which you're presenting yourself, who you are, your academic professional background, and what you're looking to do in the future. So when you're meeting with maybe the admissions count, uh, like the admissions committee or a recruiter, um, being able to really talk about who you are and what you're trying to do in a short period of time. Because let's face it, we all have limited time to being able to present yourself in the best foot forward. Networking, how to navigate networking, especially cross-culturally and globally, um, how to do so over LinkedIn, how to do so in person, how to engage and then disengage, and then maybe re-engage again without maybe being too pushy. It's, uh, it's an art, right? So knowing how to do so in a way to make sure people are remembering you favorably and not in a negative way. So we have a couple of different types of workshops. We have corporate recruiting opportunities. So again, um, I'm gonna show you the map in just a second of where we're located. But the idea is that we're inviting corporations and companies, some that are listed here, that are coming to our campuses that are speaking to our students and are either giving maybe guest speaker lectures, maybe they're providing workshops and conference settings that are like very industry based. Maybe they're just there to talk and just have a networking reception with you too. So it's just different opportunities in which you are being exposed to different elements of that industry. I believe I've covered everything here. So one-to-one -one counseling too. So I would say that, you know, again, size matters, numbers matter, but at the end of the day, we want to see your individual success. So I think that above and beyond, there are like group workshops, there are group settings and group advising, but there are one-to-one -one meetings, and I think that that's something that um, really helps us stand out as a business school in New York City. It's known to be a major city, just like Mumbai, and it's easy to get lost in the crowd, right? You know, everyone seems to just kind of be moving at their own pace, and usually that's really fast. But at our school, you're more than just a number. Uh, there's individualized attention to you every step of the way, whether that's in admissions, whether that's in advising, whether that's in the classroom setting and ensuring that if you're struggling in a class, we're connecting you with tutoring services or you're meeting with a teacher or that professor one-to-one -one, because, again, it's this close-knit environment. The same goes for career counseling and career resources and coaching. To have that one-to-one, -one, you really do build a report with those uh, advisors. And, again, they're remembering you. They know your name. You're part of a community. And, in fact, it feels like a small-knit community in a large city. So I like to think of it as the best of both worlds. And like I said, I promised I'd show you the map. So here we have Manhattan. Um, that is typically what many of us think of when you think of New York City, right? Times Square, Central Park, that is all in the borough of Manhattan. Uh, New York City is built of, or made up of five boroughs. Does everyone know what the five boroughs are? Queens. Queens is one. That's where I live. I love Queens. Uh, what else? Shout it out, it's okay. Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yes, that's one. Brooklyn, Queens. Manhattan, yep, yeah, three. How about four? Long Island. Long Island is it? No, no. Greenwich, no, that's a neighborhood in Manhattan. Staten Island. <laughs> no, everyone thinks of Staten Island. And then where the Yankees play, the Bronx. That's the Yankees play. <laughs> so north of Manhattan, we have another campus in the Bronx, and not too far from our other campus is where the New York Yankees play. So when you come to uh, New York City, you get to watch them play in the Bronx. But we are nestled in Manhattan, and this is where you think of Times Square. This is the center of commerce with Wall Street, the financial district. This is also where corporate uh, companies and organizations, uh, and Fortune 500 companies exist, and we're within walking distance of them as well. We call ourselves the Lincoln Center Campus, and that's because we're located next door to the Lincoln Center Performing Arts Center. So that's where the uh, New York City Ballet takes place. The Met Gala used to also actually take place there, but it actually has since moved to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And we also have had um, have the, um, the Nutcracker, the Opera, and Philharmonic all take place there at Lincoln Center. So we're located right next door. And we're within walking distance to Central Park, that very big black block there. That is all of Central Park, believe it or not. And I like to say again, it's the best of both worlds. You have residential neighborhoods to the north of you. You have companies and corporations that you're within networking distance of. 
and you have the opportunity to pursue different conferences, to go to and experience different elements of that industry, but then you also get to make New York City your campus. So many of our students are going all over, they're exploring the city, they're taking in museums, they're taking in art, they're taking in shows, they're taking in cuisine, that's my favorite. Before I came to India, I said that's my first introduction to India was Indian American food, going to different uh, restaurants that were made and um, are ran by families that had come from all around the world and found homes in New York and share their cuisine and culture through, through, um, sorry, let me see. there we are, <laughs> we're back, uh, through the restaurants and food. So. Uh, just one way that you can experience New York City too. You can go to Greenwich and see some of the Greenwich history there too, by the way. <laughs> but um, we have a, uh, a saying here at Fordham, and it's Fordham is my school, but New York is my campus. So um, really, you do create that sense of community at New York City, of New York City. Um, and just within the tri-state, so we recognize the tri-state as New York State, Connecticut, and New Jersey, and within that tri-state community in which many people are uh, commuting into um, Manhattan for work, for commerce, uh, we have over 11,000 alumni that are from the Gabelli School alone. So our business school has a reach of 11,000 locally, and then across the world, our, our Gabelli Global Network is 40,000 plus, and then as a university, Fordham has over 100,000, 180,000 accounting across the world as well. And so when I say all these tri-state areas too, that's other areas you can locate and actually be a part of. So across the river there to the left, that's New Jersey. So you have Hoboken, where uh, Frank Sinatra is from. Many of our, of our students might live there or Jersey City. And to the right of the um, island, that's where you have Brooklyn and Queens. So some of our students might live all over the um, area of New York, the metropolitan area. And again, that's how many of our students might afford to um, stay in New York as well. It is an expensive city. And we do provide graduate housing to students. So you do have the opportunity to find like a, it's a studio apartment that we would have for you as graduate housing. It's located across the park. So you get to take a nice little scenic walk across the park by Columbus Circle. It's a uh, subway hub of sorts. So many um, other trains are connecting not too far from where we're located. So again, a great location for that as well. Um, so students might opt to have a studio for just themselves, but most students find that it's more cost affordable if they have roommates in New York City. And I personally think that you get to see a different side of New York when you live in a borough like, Man um, like Queens or Brooklyn. So oftentimes you do see students that might be living in Queens and Brooklyn or New Jersey and then commuting into um, Lincoln Center as well. That's totally normal as well too. All right, and I kind of alluded to some of the different experiential learning and um, opportunities for our students, but it's more than just going to class and then going home and that being that. So um, at our school, we do have uh, multiple different opportunities for our students to get involved. Um, the first I will point out is the one that's the furthest away here. So we'll start on the far, far right, and that's our organizations. And we have over 24, sorry about the formatting that might be on me there, but over 24 different graduate student organizations and clubs. Those clubs and organizations are a combination of industry and socially based and affinity based clubs. So we do have um, organizations that are based off of, let's say, your interests in a particular area of business. So finance society, marketing society, maybe the Media and Entertainment Alliance, our Fordham Accounting and Tax Society. And these organizations are really focused on a particular area of business, bringing networking opportunities to our students through those uh, industries as well and hosting conferences um, that will enrich your experience through like guest speaker series, workshops, and also networking opportunities too. So we have finance um, conferences, we have a Fordham Women in Business Conference. So for those ladies out there that are looking to pursue business, but you know, are trying to find that empowerment and trying to find that like support, it's really great to have that behind you. So it's a really awesome conference and opportunity for networking. We bring alumni back, we bring guest speakers and industry speakers to campus as well. And then on the cultural and affinity side, we have um, our uh, South Asian Business Association, which is a really great opportunity for our students from India. And we uh, actually celebrate different cultural backgrounds. And one of them is uh, different celebrations that some of our Indian students bring. So like we actually did just celebrate Diwali on our campus. But um, we do also have other uh, groups like our Chinese Business Society. So we'll do like a spring festival. 
um, and other fun kind of activities too. You even had like a talent show. So some of our masters and graduate students are able to actually perform. And so it brings about like a lightness where it's a community, but then also we're a business school. So networking is still a big deal. It's a really strong emphasis as well. So it brings a lot of community together. Um, these are all organizations that are ran through our graduate students and programs. So um, MBA students are welcome to join. All of our specialized master's students are welcome to join. And it allows you to make friends, meet people outside of your classes and outside of your programs. So you can still meet people from all across the Academy School of Business. And we have approximately 1,500 people in the programs across from all the different years. So of course, naturally, you may have um, a smaller class size, but you have the opportunity to meet so many different people from all around the world with different backgrounds and different experiences as well, too. So aside from students coming from India, we have students who might be coming from different parts of Europe. We have students coming from Africa. We have students coming from South America and places like Brazil and Peru. We have students coming from the United States. And certainly we have students coming from our neighbor to the north, Canada. So you do see quite a few students that represent world perspectives and that come from experiences across multiple industries as well too. We have a responsible business coalition, so starting from the left there, it is a center that really focuses on um, working with different companies across New York City and consulting with them on better business uh, practices. So being a Jesuit school and being a business school within a Jesuit school, um, we do have a uh, motto called business with purpose. So our students are able to help consult and analyze different um, companies. Right now we're working with finance companies or financial firms to assess different ethical um, practices within the areas of finance. But previously, the year before, we had a focus on fashion. So the Responsible Business Coalition had a conference that talked about greenwashing, that talked about um, different er um, practices of fast fashion and how to prevent that. And we actually had invited the CEO of Abercrombie and Fitch to come give a talk to our students at that conference. And she is actually a Gabelli MBA alum. So that was something that was really proud to have represented. We have our thoughtful leadership certificates. I've kind of mentioned this before too. This is a professional development certificate that you would pursue. Typically it takes place on Fridays when you do not have class. And there are elements of um, self-assessment in which you identify your strengths you identify how you um, collaborate and um, contribute to team environments and it allows you to kind of lean into those strengths in different simulations and business projects. So it's very much working on uh, your professional development outside of the classroom experience as well too. You have the opportunity for leadership mentorships and we do also do um, retreats that are uh, program based. So again, kind of getting to know your cohort outside of that classroom experience. And then last but not least, we have our Fordham Foundry and then our Fordham Angel Fund. So if you have a business and entrepreneurial idea, this is where our incubators take place. And many of our students are growing their ideas across different uh, industries and they are utilizing the network across all of our programs. So what better way to build a business idea than in a business school where you have maybe minds from marketing and minds from strategy and minds from finance and minds from accounting. Why not bring that all together to make a, um, a profitable business idea? So we have pitch competitions where some of our students will actually compete for different uh, funding for their uh, business ideas. So if you have a business idea, bring it on to graduate school, right? All right, so as promised, we're gonna get into the application requirements. Um, as well as the cost of attendance. And then we'll finish out with some questions that you might have as well too. So hang tight, I know it's been a lot of talking on my end, sorry. So for the application requirements, typically we take into account a more holistic evaluation perspective. So it's again, not about the numbers. This is a trend here today, right? It's not about the numbers that you're presenting to us. So of course, when you're applying to a specialized master's degree, we do want to make sure academically you are going to be successful in that program. So seeing your grades in certain classes is going to be important. If you're studying in finance, we want to make sure that you're doing well in those finance classes, right? Accounting courses, those prerequisite courses I mentioned in economics and stats, having a demonstrated strength academically is important. But there's more to finding your fit in the class than that. So we do take into consideration your 
uh, professional resume and CV, which is uh, a requirement for the application process. We look at any internships you might be pursuing. We might be looking at other opportunities in which you have had maybe leadership roles. Have you started a not-for-profit? Do you volunteer? Are you part of clubs and organizations here at St. Xavier's? Or have you helped out and mentor or maybe been part of different tutoring opportunities while you've been in class? So these are all different elements that go into possibly that resume beyond the professional opportunities too. Like I said, I think it's really important, especially as a student coming from outside the U.S., that if you are really determined to find a job placement in the U.S., that you are really considering professional opportunities in your home country as well and really understanding what that industry is like that you're pursuing. So when you do get to the United States and you're studying, no matter where you're at, that you really have a targeted idea as to what kind of function would I be interested in pursuing in this uh, industry and what are maybe the skill gaps and knowledge that I need to connect what I want to do to what I have done in the past. So having a professional idea of that or a professional goal might be something that you know comes from having that experience in an internship setting, volunteer setting, or even maybe pursuing some work as well too. It isn't uncommon, though it's not required, it isn't uncommon for some of our students to have had working for, uh, experience that's full time before applying to some of our master's programs too. So keep in mind that though they're pre experience or specialized masters, some of our students have found, some of our stronger candidates have found that it does help to work. And of course, that merit scholarship reflects that too. So I'll get to that as well um, and how we consider merit scholarship consideration. Uh, in terms of the other items for the application, the GMAT, GRE, and executive assessment, the GMAT and GRE are actually optional. And executive assessments for a professional working um, uh, programs like the uh, professional MBA and executive MBA, so you don't have to worry about that. But the GMAT and GRE are completely optional. You do not need to complete those uh, tests or exams. Um, it can be something you may want to consider if you're coming from a non-quantitative or analytical background. So this could help kind of strengthen your candidacy. It can also strengthen candidacy for merit-based scholarship, but it's not required. So it's up to you to kind of decide, like, does it make sense for you to submit this or not? Um, for some students that might be coming from like a non-quant major, that might be pursuing a quant major, uh, program, I should say, that that might be some way that you can differentiate yourself and, again, prove that you have the abilities to be successful in a more quantitative background. The uh, TOEFL, IELTS, PT, and Duolingo English scores are all um, not necessary or are completely optional for students like yourselves coming from India and especially coming from St. Xavier. So you do not have to submit any of those English proficiency exams to us at all. Um, the essays are included in your application, so we do have different prompts that may vary from year to year. Um, some of them are addressing your, uh, any challenges or adversity that you had maybe had experience throughout your time learning or, you know, uh, any background that you want to share with us that makes you a unique candidate with possibly a unique perspective. We also have essays that might ask specifically about um, your professional goals and well, how you plan to pertain those goals as well. So again, really looking at your writing style and then how you're presenting yourself professionally through your writing. Professional recommendations are also not required, so you do not need to submit a letter of recommendation from an advisor or a faculty member if you do not choose to. But again, if you want to have someone who can maybe speak on your professional um, potential for success, or maybe you've had a really great uh, relationship with an advisor or a faculty member who can, again, speak to your professionalism, then maybe that might be something you may want to consider. Uh, typically, our students are only submitting one to two letters of recommendation, so um, anything above that is a little above and beyond what we would consider to be excessive. Um, and then finally, last but not least, after you've submitted all these items, the admissions interview is uh, an item in which you would be invited to attend virtually. We don't expect you to fly across the world to meet with us in New York City, but we will sign on with you on Zoom and ask you some questions about why you're pursuing this program, why are you interested in us as a school, and how are we planning to help you attain your professional goals. And um, it's also another opportunity for you to ask us questions as well and really considering like what are the opportunities for you that make this a good fit for you as well too. I like to think that you're investing your time and we're investing our resources on you too. So it's a give and take relationship. So you should make sure that this is also a good fit for you too. And once all these items are submitted, typically the review process is four to five weeks. 
and then we um, will have a decision for you that includes not only your offer of admission, but then any merit-based scholarship consideration as well. So I'll get into that next. We do have um, around deadlines for fall 2024. I do believe that some of you hadn't said if, they were, if you were interested in 2024, so that's fine. But I will tell you that um, if you apply for future years, so like fall 25 or 26, um, usually we do fall into like similar time frame. So um, you can expect that round one will still have a deadline in January. You can expect that um, there could be a round four deadline that's going to be closer to June. And the date exactly will change, obviously, with the calendar. Why these dates matter? So you are submitting your documents that um, are required for the application by those dates. And then we, in turn, will get you a decision four to five weeks after you've submitted that, that um, the application and, require, and required materials. So, um, you know, pushed along to the next round, you receive that decision within a month or so. We encourage students to apply early to be considered for merit-based award because it is limited. So not every student who applies receives merit award. Now, being a student from St. Xavier's is going to give you a huge advantage. Because of our partnership, um, it is really important that we do honor this and we do want to make sure that we're acknowledging the reputation of the program in which you're coming from. So, of course, we will uh, have high consideration for your scholarship. But that doesn't mean it's a cakewalk, as we say. You still need to make sure you're presenting yourself in the most professional way because, again, we want to make sure that you are also committed to our program as well, too. So don't, uh, don't get too relaxed in the application process because you know we have the partnership. Make sure that you're still presenting yourself in the most professional light as well. And for that consideration, we highly recommend applying as early as the March 22nd deadline. But if you apply sooner than that, that's even better. You might be considered for an even higher scholarship because of that. So that's, again, merit-based and based off of our budget. And because you're a student coming from outside the United States, there is a visa process that follows after you submit your application and after you receive your admissions decision. And I see some of you saying, yes, I know. This is, <laughs> that's a big deal. And there is a lot that goes into that visa process. So we recognize it does take a little bit of time. It can be a little confusing at times, and we do provide support. We have an office that is dedicated to helping you through that process, too. So with that being said, you know, you do need a little bit of time to process all your required documents. So we do say that if you are unable to submit your uh, application by rounds one and two, that as an international student, you do not submit anything past round three. So anything after that May deadline could mean that you're really pushing it very close because once you receive your decision in say like June, you only have just a few weeks, just a few months to submit all the documents needed for the visa, to receive the visa um, uh, interview or the embassy interview, and then finally to receive the I-20. So we recognize that can be a long time, and we really want to make sure that you don't uh, put yourself in a stressful situation because you're applying too late. So we do encourage students to apply as early as possible. And actually, maybe I should go back one second too. Um, there is a difference between the spring programs and the fall. So not all of our programs are offered in the spring. All programs are offered in the fall. So if you have an interest in media management or accounting, the spring deadline is typically in October. Um, but then every other, all of our other programs are offered in the fall. So you have the option for those programs to apply for either fall or spring. But really, our students are. Um, mostly applying for fall intake for all of our programs. Yeah. Sorry, yes. Oh, yeah. Hello, friends. I'm Father Keith D'Souza. You may recognize me. I'm the director. I'd really like to push for this global leadership program because we would like to see you all become leaders. Everybody who part, that's our vision of our college. Wherever you are, any part of the globe or India, We'd like you to do well. And uh, we'd like to facilitate the opportunity for students to go abroad to study. Indians are assuming leadership positions in different uh, parts of the world. But we'd like you to be leaders of the difference. So, see, there's no harm in going directly to study abroad. But we would like to push for this value education, business ethics. So that's our agenda, if you may use. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Dr. Ashley Tellis. He happens to be visiting us today. He is a, a senior fellow at the Carnegie uh, Endowment uh, uh, for International Peace. You know, there are several think tanks across the India also has some important think tanks.
Carnegie Endowment is one of the world's best think tanks, especially for international relations. So he's in Washington, D.C. He's a student of ours, married a student of ours as well, and she also is uh, in Washington. And uh, he did his PhD at the University of Chicago. So maybe Ashley, you can come and say a few words to encourage them to this University of Chicago is an Ivy League university in the United States. And even he was two years senior to be in the college. And even at that time, he used to write for the Times of India. And it was the editorial page, the bottom, you had these analysis, uh, an different analytical articles. And he used to write about defense and defense deals. And he's also one of those who's instrumental in pushing for good relations between the United States and India. You know, too young to remember, but maybe some years back when we were negotiating for nuclear understanding, but nuclear, uh, you know, freedom between these two, between these two countries, India. Ashley was working with at that time Manmohan Singh, I think, government was there. Condor, he was working with Condoleezza Rice, George Bush on the other side. So he's very influential, very unassuming. And we just had a long interview with the Department of Interreligious Studies on geopolitics related to our theme of of uh, uh, rejuvenation. But maybe you can say a couple of words to encourage them to take leadership seriously in whatever field. They are all uh, doing big data, right? I think they are doing a master's in big data. BSCIT. One step before big data. Christina, sorry to disturb you. I must apologize, I did not mean to intrude. But I'll just make a plug for Jesuit education. If you have enjoyed being here at St. Xavier's in Bombay, you will enjoy follow. I spent three years of my life, soon after I left India actually, uh, as a researcher at Georgetown University, it's a Josh, uh, Jesuit University in Washington, D.C. And the standards that are maintained in Jesuit universities throughout the United States are absolutely fantastic. So take, uh, take the proposals from Fordham seriously. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be. I've actually visited Fordham several times uh, in my years back home. And I really want to just wish you all the best. And so listen attentively. Listen to this slide in particular. It's dollars and cents. But I can just promise you one thing that, you know, when you spend money like this at a university like Fordham, uh, it's always money well spent because you come out of the university with a set of career skills that will always hold you in good stead. So I'm going to yield the microphone and I really, really apologize for the intrusion. intrusion for sure, right? <laughs> so as I was saying, um, obviously as we we're talking about that cost of attendance, also keep in mind that return on investment and what you're getting out of the experience as well. Um, of course, you know, the United States, it is a bit of an investment. I think a bit of an investment is an understatement, but there is an investment needed in order to pursue your studies in New York City. Um, though it is a wonderful place, it is not the cheapest place to be. So keep in mind that, you know, though you are investing in your future, you're investing in your education, there is that return that comes with the experience of studying in a major city like New York, in a place where you're going to be connected with different industry professionals, in a setting in which it is smaller knit. So that means that you aren't waiting to be connected with those individuals. You're going to be front and center, whether it's through award-winning faculty or through different networking opportunities from alumni or guest speakers. That's something that, you know, that really does go into the value of the experience itself as well. So we have the cost of attendance. So this is the current 2023 to 2024 tuition. And so for the full-time MBA program, typically we have a, uh, it is a price that is um, going to cover all four semesters of study. Those are the two years. So that blanketed price is 120784 So it can be a bit of a, again, of an investment, but students are considered for merit-based scholarship, whether they're applying for full-time MBA or the specialized master's degree. For the specialized master's, we do have the uh, Master of Science tuition that is based off of credit per program. So if you're charged tuition per credit, and so some of our programs have credits that may vary from 
30 credits all the way upwards to 39 credits. So depending on how many credits you're uh, in, enrolled in, that will also constitute how much tuition you're paying. So for the MS in Finance program and MS in Management, you're looking at roughly 60,000 USD for that program. And then keep in mind that we do have through the uh, Global Leadership Program with St. Xavier's that does deduct some credits here. So we're looking at instead of having the full 30, you're looking at six credits that would be transferable into the program. So you're paying much less because of that. Um, that does help, again, kind of um, alleviate the cost of attendance. In addition to the Global Leadership Partnership Program, we do also consider our students, especially those from St. Xavier's, again, we have this partnership for a reason. We're recognizing you as a student from a reputable institution. You've worked your butt off here, and we want to make sure that we're awarding that through the merit. So it's academic-based scholarship. And so we're looking at that through your financing your degree in the merit scholarship section. Those are typically ranging from 10,000 to 30,000 per program. So some of our students may receive that discount depending on your academic strength. So how well have you done in your classes? And then also how relevant is some of your professional opportunities and some of the experiences you've had? So internships, any full-time jobs, these are all very important things to consider in terms of that merit-based scholarship. We do also have, in addition to the tuition, there are other fees I'd want you to be aware of. So then that way, let's face it, we're not trying to surprise you when you're there. Um, we do have our one-time enrichment fee that goes into your professional development. So that will really look at um, the responsible leadership um, certificate program that I was talking about that's professional development outside of the classroom. And then we also have co-curricular activities that take place alongside your program as well. So that is also something to consider with the one-time fee. That is um, for the MS programs, 3,450. So that's only for the first semester that you're built. So depending on what program you're in, you have a fall semester built based off the classes you've been enrolled in, spring. And then for some um, programs, you finish out in the summer, uh, summer or fall. So typically, there are two to three semesters um, or enrollment in the specialized master's degrees. In addition to that one-time enrichment fee, we do have recurring fees. So as you're enrolled in the program, you probably are aware that you know health insurance in the United States is a little bit different than in other places around the world. So as an institution, we provide you with health insurance. So you would pay for that through us. And so that ensures that, God forbid, not that would, if anything should happen, you are covered, you're taken care of, there will be medical expenses that would be covered through that insurance. So you are going to be okay if you fall ill or something should occur so your parents can rest a little easier, but you would have a fall insurance and then spring and summer insurance. So the spring and summer insurance, it has a larger fee because it covers two semesters. You also have technology fees as well as foreign study fees. So that foreign study fee goes towards our Office of International Student Services. I was talking about them before in regards to the visa process, which is a bit of a lengthy, sometimes confusing process. And so we have an office that is dedicated to knowing all the rules for US immigration and what you need to submit for the process coming in. And then while you're um, enrolled in the program itself, if you decide you'd like to venture back to India to see your friends and loved ones, um, we would work with you to ensure that you know what documents you need for when you are coming back or when you're leaving. So that's an office that specializes in that area. There, there is an additional resource to you. So of course, use it. And you would also use that uh, resource too when you are on your way out and you're going through the, um, the uh, process for the OPT, the Occupational Practicum Training through STEM. Again, having that additional resource and someone to go to who knows the ins and outs of U.S. immigration. All right, and so finally, in addition to that merit-based scholarship, so like I said, it ranges from 10,000 to 30,000 per program. So typically you'll see that in your admissions offered letter. You've been admitted, congratulations. By the way, you also have this scholarship. And typically the scholarship is applied in the first two semesters of enrollment. So you're looking at, say, a $20,000 scholarship. You see the 10,000 in fall and the 10,000 in spring. So that's where that would lie for you. We make that very clear. So then that way, there's no questioning that as well. In addition to the merit scholarship, we do also offer opportunities for graduate assistantships. So these are what we call GA positions. They're not like teaching assistants though. We don't have TAs. 
Um, our program is small enough where we actually have faculty that are always teaching. There's no TAs, but we may have like tutors. We may have those um, students who are working alongside faculty in research or maybe administrative um, tasks. We've seen students that might be working for the marketing area. Maybe they are assisting with um, helping with data and helping to go through like placement data and working on the website updates. Um, we may have students that might be working in administrative offices like admissions that might be assisting my team with recruiting, meeting with admitted students and really shining the light on the uh, current student experience. Um, or maybe perhaps you're assisting with administrative tasks through like academic advising or career services offices too. So a couple of different, they're basically jobs that you would have on campus. And um, though through your visa, you're not allowed to work full time in the U.S. as an international student studying under an F1 visa. Um, this would allow you to receive a stipend and that stipend would then be applied toward your bill. Typically, that ranges from 3,500 per semester all the way up to 7,000. So again, it's almost like an additional scholarship you can get in addition to um, that merit-based award that you would receive in your admissions letter. We do also have uh, continuing student scholarships. So those are scholarships offered through the generosity of our alumni. And so they have actually donated monies and funds to help support your education. So that is something you would apply to between fall semester and spring. We would let you know how to go through that process, so it's all through your email, but students are considered for that. It can be competitive, but it is something that is an additional cost alleviator as well. And then last but not least, we do also accept private loans as well, and we do usually work very closely with Prodigy Finance. They're a company that works with students from outside the U.S. and works and specializes in working with students who might bank outside the U.S. as well. So there's no need for a U.S. co-signer, and you are able to uh, work with that company based off of where you bank as well. All right, so some of the other transparent costs, I did break it down by the MS and finance program here specifically. So, oops, sorry about that. Oh, I don't know if I can go back. Is there any other? I'm sorry about that. Got a little too click heavy there. But yeah, so then you can see the, um, based off of the MS and finance degree, keep in mind that you may have additional classes that you might take for the prerequisites. So I did include like a range that you would expect based off of the fall 2023 numbers as well. So that's typically your range between 60,960 to possibly 69. That's only if you're taking all of those prerequisites. So if you're coming in with a strong finance background, academically, you wouldn't need the additional prereqs so you can lean closer towards that smaller figure. And the same for the MS in management too. So just to kind of give you an idea as to what it looks like without the global leadership, keep in mind that that does deduct six credits. So it's actually even um, less expensive than what I'm showing you here. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when we have the additional costs here. All right, I know it's been long awaited. <laughs> Any questions? This is, this is my team that wasn't able to join me today. Uh, we have admissions at, um, officers who specialize in individual programs themselves. So though I oversee the admissions process for all of our specialized masters, I couldn't do it alone. I am one woman. So I do have a team um, that assists me with these specialized master's degrees. So if you're looking at finance, John Versace is your, your fellow there. He can um, assist you with that process. If you're looking for MS in management, my colleague Nikki DeCastro can also provide you with assistance one-to-one. -one. I'm also here to help as well too. So anything I can do to help you out as well too, never, um, never hesitate to reach out to me. But are there any questions? I know you've all been sitting so patiently. Any questions at all? No? I know I was thorough, but there's no way I was that thorough. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> I also understand if some questions might be unnerving and maybe uncomfortable to ask in front of a podium. So I can also stay here, and if you want to ask me any one-to-one -one questions, I can hang out. And you can ask me them one-to-one -one as well. But I do want to thank you all. I know you're very busy, and it's probably been a long day. So thank you so much for sitting through my presentation. It's been an honor to be here. It's my first time in India, and I've been so welcomed. And you're a big part of that. Thank you so much.
Okay, if you do have questions, we are located on the ground floor of the XIC building, uh, XDP. So we have an office there, you can meet with us. There's Clarissa or there's Oscar D'Souza. You can come and meet up with us. And we'll be glad to answer your questions. Uh, okay, so thank, thank you for your participation. And uh, thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you.